Welcome in this uh, Socratic interview uh, within the project of Realizing uh, Europe, Realize Europe. We are talking with Darmendra Kanani, which is a, a, a person who was very active for 26 years in the public life, in volunteer life and creating funds for all sorts of projects and very active in the European cause. And also now one of the, the starters uh, in this uh, Friends for Europe, uh, you can say foundation. And the Friends of uh, Europe Foundation, you can see on the website, is a very hopeful initiative to create good futures and make us think differently in a completely new approach on the future of Europe. Um, my question to you is: uh, You see a lot of interesting, um, a lot of interesting uh, starting points in the vision on Europe, mm -hmm. like uh, crafting a new approach, uh, lifelong learning, uh, sort of account for persons, quality of life, a reset. We have to reset. Can you um, elaborate on what are the elements? in your personal uh, mind, what are the elements for a new narrative of Europe, if you think about a complete reset? In terms of the um, elements that, from my perspe our perspective as a think tank, are the things that are required if we are to reset Europe in a way that deals with a central conundrum and that central conundrum is the ability of a set of institutions that were set up to enable peace to continue, uh, for security to be apparent and for there to be economic growth based on the principle of people coming together as a continent would serve the lives of you know 450 million uh, people better than individual states operating by themselves for the past 70 years or so that has been successful when we think about it in the context of the post world war ii scenario that the world found itself in and in particular a continent that both uh, gave rise to the most terrible moral crimes that the world has not sufficiently got to terms with or learnt sufficiently from, um, through to a continent that now enjoys um, a level of peace and security and prosperity which perhaps has been lost sight of from the people that these institutions are intended to serve. And that central tenant is the one of confidence and trust between people on the ground in, 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 in towns and cities across Europe and what they see as this thing called the European Union. And in terms of a reset from our perspective, as we are in the earlier, early part of the 21st century, is to ask that question is that, is the way in which we govern, the way in which we lead, the way in which we connect to people sufficient to meet our needs now and into the future 70 years, if you like. And so our starting point was to think about the disconnect between citizen and institution. And underpinning that was the erosion, is the erosion of trust and confidence in those institutions that are made up of people. And I suppose what we have said in this document is that the reset involves being clear that your driver is to rebuild that connection. And if you are to do that, what we require is a different concept of power sharing. And, and in this we say, majority of our parliamentary processes and structures have been crafted in a time that suited the circumstances and the evolution of thinking and democracy. And with the onset of digitalization, um, a very different type of generation of individuals that have grown up uh, in this century, uh, but also in the latter half of the last century, we need to craft and hatch a different kind of approach to what we understand as being representative democracy 
and participatory democracy. So in power sharing, what we say is that we need to have a different mindset amongst politicians and institutions to think that actually, whilst we have an elected representative, that's not enough anymore. What we need is citizens to be part of the decision making, part of the uh, discussion around what makes life better in terms of policy making, whether that's to do with skills, climate change, or security, okay. and to create a much more of a, uh, a setting which enables that power sharing to take place. So what you uh, stated was that there is a central conundrum in this whole approach, and that is uh, looking at the ability of institutions to connect to citizens. We have a history of solving a lot of uh, deep traumas, not really digested, but partly transformed into a peaceful uh, continent. But the institutions who have made this possible doesn't get that uh, trust from the citizens. So that's a, re a real problem because we have to continue, of course, this peacemaking, uh, this process and this development in the European peace. And then you say we need a reset to make other governmental relations with citizens. So we have to rebuild this connection. And the essential word is trust mm. in this. And you said you realize that by power, share, power sharing. And that you uh, gave another argument because uh, we are living, we were living in an industrial era and we're now living in a, a digitalization area with digitalized people. So we need different forms of democracy. And a very concrete one is that uh, if you once are elected, it's not done, then it starts because you have to involve uh, people to participate in power. So there is a shift in the mindset of representatives and there have to be a shift to uh, create a space for this power share. That's what you said, is that correct? Indeed, absolutely, it is what I said, but um, at the heart of it, at the heart of this, is a deeply philosophical question about what we mean by government, size of government, and the role of government in the future, and how we think of the, about the role it has to play in the welfare of citizens. Historically, it has been a relationship that's been almost a, I would describe it, a one-to-many. So you have an institution that relates to hundreds of millions of people and it levers its way in relation to the private sector, civil society, etc. And what we're saying is the power sharing means that actually it becomes a many-to-many -many relationship. You begin to think differently about how to govern, um, how to make lives better, that um, really calls into question that very, um, let's say, pyramidical approach to government and governance and you're looking at a much more of a circular approach to how you govern and that's what we mean by power sharing is that you make better decisions you'll create better trust you have increased confidence if the people that you are serving um, are part of that journey of governance and that's the fundamental difference that we're we're posing in this and that requires a a shift in mindset amongst leaders and to think differently about I am represented, I have therefore a mandate, I then go back every four years or three years and I do a few constituency services um, and we have few consult consultations with citizens. This is not working, we know, and we need to change that leadership mindset but also institutional mindset to free up and share power more. You said there is a fundamental philosophical question and that's, uh, that is the question, what is government? Because uh, that's a key question if you want to change this relationship. And how, uh, what is the role in to create welfare for, this, for the citizens? Mm -hmm. uh, historically, you said it's one towards many. It's the pyramidical uh, pr uh, model. And you are pleading for a circular model where it is many to many. Essential is that people are, taking, are, t are participating in the process of decision making. That's power sharing, you defined that. And uh, that means a lot of things. And one thing you mentioned was that it is a mindset shift in the uh, representatives 
and a mindset shift in the institutions. So two elements. Can you elaborate on that, please? Indeed. I think let's um, think for a moment um, how a system um, continues to repeat itself because it's based on a certain set of values and a philosophy of purpose. Um, and so you continue to operate it without question. You make improvements every now and again, but you don't actually fundamentally shift its operating purpose or the way the system actually operates. Because any institution is made up of power. Um, and what we're saying is that we need to think differently and better about how that power operates and to understand the dynamic of power um, and what it does for a citizen or a public servant, a private sector person, etc., and so forth. And we're saying is that we are moving into a world where perhaps we need to have more shared accountability, shared sense of purpose and greater sense of individual agency that's collective. And part of that means that the model that we have of governance would suggest that the brain sits only within an institution. And what we're saying is you will serve institutions, public institutions will be served better if they think about the brain being around them, uh, both in the wider society, in communities, and in the places they intend to actually have an impact and benefit. So this is really very much thinking through how do you draw on what some people call collective intelligence, people call crowdsourcing ideas, but actually a very different mindset about where the brain sits in any one place. And part of this suggests our philosophy or our approach is that actually governments and institutions will be served better if they think differently about where the brain sits and where problem solving can take place. And historically, our assumption has been in the pyramidal approach or the uh, you know, one-to-many approach is that the problem solving in the brain happens here and that gets delivered. Whereas we're saying actually the time has changed for that and we need a much more circular approach where you think about the brain as being around you and to jointly problem solve with those who you intend to serve. Okay. You said, um, well, it's in general a system will continue its purpose and values because that's fixed and that's uh, it, it, you can say it's a sort of addiction it repeats itself mm. and it will improve sometimes itself but that's not sufficient anymore so we need a reset because we cannot reach a shift if we don't change values and purposes then you said uh, we have to think differently we have to understand power and maybe understand power differently because power was not the hierarchical from up top to down. The brain is at the top and the execution is uh, every level lower. But now we say the brain is around also in all the participants. And this is a fundamental shift in philosophical approach, you said, eh? because the brain is around, it's circular, not pyramidal. Can you elaborate on that? In terms of how that might work, so if you were to view those that you are intended to serve or as a politician or policymaker or even a private sector business you begin to think about those who consume your services or those who receive public services and those whose welfare is as a part of your responsibility if you think of individuals as in two forms as assets in the decision making problem solving scenario but always, also as shareholders, uh, which is a different model of shareholding. Not in the classic sense that you have a top-down company with a group of men in particular that will uh, receive benefit through shares of a company. What we're suggesting in here is that if you, treat, if you regard citizens and wider community as assets and them, themselves as also shareholders, you get this mutuality of purpose and accountability and a sense of ownership of the European project. And so you, you expand and rethink the model of shareholding so that everyone becomes a shareholder of that European dream or the European project. And that requires you to behave very differently in how you structure dialogue, how you make policy, how you include and create a very different infrastructure for making policy and implementation of it. You said um, 
how it might work, because uh, we can also go on deeper on the philosophical assumption, but now you start with how this might work. And then you said, uh, we have to take this uh, very seriously, this whole new uh, communication process, and we have to uh, uh, regard individuals in two aspects, as assets and as shareholders, so that we have uh, purpose and accountability together. And that means that the ownership is more spread and that everybody feels part of this uh, enterprise, the European dream. Can you elaborate on that? Um, if I give you um, a further expansion of that thinking where it comes from, when we, when we think about developments in the past, simply let's say 20 years, the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about it, it was a crisis of trust. Um, many men took risk uh, at an excessive rate and the levers of governance and power were not sufficient to address them, check them or create a balance of them. And you had a, uh, a whole system that in, in, in effect was based on the basis of more profit. And actually that profit at the expense of sufficient checks and balances and governance. And now you have seen in the past 15 years, senior bankers, senior traders, who we now know were fixing interest rates, were making money deals in different ways, were uh, placing risk on the individuals of citizens uh, across Europe and the world. Um, that's one example. Why, what I mean, what I'm talking about, would shift that dialogue in terms of how I've described a different model, because therefore you'd have a different governance model and you have a different sense of relationship between those who are involved in making money, creating capital flows, etc. Let's move forward a little bit to uh, gender inequality. The hashtag Me Too campaign, the, it's been one of those, um, it's been evolving, but it's, it's, a, it's a real um, re revelation of how a system has supported mm a view of women and power. And so even most powerful actresses or bankers, uh, journalists, etc., have learned that actually, if a man's going to touch me and I'm on my way up, it's okay because I, it's not too bad. It's all right, that's how it is, but I need to move up. And the system encourages that behavior and you continue with it until you get to a tipping point. And that's where we've seen a number of tipping points. The financial one was one. I think the gender one was about women being able to actually, for the first time, say, this system I'm drowning in, I've seen it ever since I've been a child. And the system actually rewards a behavior of my silence and the, ab the ability of men to continue as they are. And we're seeing a change in that. And that the third element is our youth, our young people. So Greta, you know, Thunberg, the, this, a child that sits outside, a uh, outside the parliament and says, you are delivering me an environment that is not going to be sufficient or enable my livelihood into the future, which has now spawned a movement globally. And now we're seeing teenagers across the world almost um, indignant and sharp in their criticism of few, uh, older generations to say, the way you've run the system has actually led us to where we are. And now we need to think differently about that system. And so they create a fulcrum of change to, amongst leaders and others. And that's why now you have countries declaring a climate, uh, climate emergency. But the next phase is about how that then changes governance and policy making. Okay. So you gave as a sort of uh, example of this new approach uh, of assets and uh, shareholders in one in the citizen, you gave three tipping points. The financial crisis is very clear because people were profiting from a very one-sided model of governance uh, next to the pyramid. The second one was the Me Too, where, where the system uh, favors uh, the women uh, suppression by uh, rich men or poor men. And that was a systematically uh, uh, you could say, sustainable system in itself, and it could not continue. So that was a tipping point. And the youth are not accepting uh, what we are as adults are doing uh, with them. 